beautiful cobblestone streets with colorful houses and pristine architecture. It looks like these towns have been plucked out of a fairy tale, but these are indeed real places. For today's video, we're going to explore 15 of the most beautiful fairy tale towns in the world. Let's start with number 15, Rottenburg ob der Taube. In many ways, Rottenburg ob der Taube is the perfect fairy tale city. After all, it was apparently the inspiration for the town in Disney's rendition of the fairy tale Pinocchio, and has streets lined with beautiful medieval homes and shops. When considered alongside its medieval wall, beautiful market square in front of the city hall, and the famous Plonheim Tower, it's not hard to see why this town gets its fair share of visitors from around the globe. Number 14. Old Quebec City while Quebec City is now a bustling metropolis that's home to over half a million people, the neighborhood of Old Quebec City hails from another era. Established by the French explorer Samuel du Champlain all the way back in 1608, the area has a very old-world European vibe, especially since many of its buildings were constructed in the 17th and 18th centuries. This scenic setting is completed by the one and only Chateau Frontenac, which is a massive hotel that towers over the old town. If you've got some cash to splash, it's definitely a great place to stay the night. Number 13. Bybury For many, the British Cotswolds are an idyllic destination filled with green, rolling hills, well-preserved woodlands, and beautiful villages. However, Bybury in particular is one of the more popular spots for tourists to visit. Famous for its cottages made of a limestone material known as Cotswold stone, Certain sites such as Arlington Row, the Church of St. Mary, and the Bybury Trout Farm are well-loved attractions. Thanks in part both to its beauty and approximately a thousand-year history, it's also a very significant village, so notable in fact that it's even depicted on the inside cover of some British passports. So if you want to experience all that England has to offer, Bybury is a must-see. Number 12. Hallstatt if you were to sail along the namesake Lake Hallstatt, you would eventually come across the town of Hallstatt. It's renowned for producing salt since prehistoric times. It was the town's main source of income for centuries, especially since it's located in a rather remote area of central Austria that didn't allow it to access much else. However, it's perhaps because of this seclusion that its charming wood cabins and beautiful old church have been left more or less untouched. And while the town of less than a thousand is quite small, it's now become a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a popular tourist center. And it's so famous that a full-scale replica of it has been built in southeast China. Number 11. Sils Maria If you're looking for a place with near-complete peace and quiet, you can't go wrong with Sils Maria. One of the few towns out there where you can only get around either on horse or by foot, small settlements located about 1,800 meters above sea level on the Austrian-Italian border. A quintessential medieval German town, its most famous inhabitant has been the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who lived there in the summer of 1881 and between 1883 and 1888. Ever since, other celebrities such as Pablo Neruda, Thomas Mann, and Marcel Proust have also made an appearance. So, if you're looking for a great place to both relax and wander through a village stuck in the picturesque past, you should give Sils Maria a visit. Number 10. Rocamador While Rocamador has a population of just 600, each and every year it receives a whopping 1 million visitors, and it's not hard to see why. Inhabited ever since the days of the cavemen, Rocamador as we see it today was mainly built during the Middle Ages. A highly segregated village, the situation was such that each level of the village housed people of a different social class. For example, while the knights lived on a high clifftop, the religious lived in the middle and the common lay people lived at the bottom. Throughout this tiered system, there are roads that interconnect everything and lots of medieval buildings, making the whole thing very picturesque. While this beauty certainly plays a part in why this place receives so many visitors, the real reason why they flock here is due to the town's status as a pilgrimage site. You see, in the year 1105, a small chapel was built into the cliffside, and in 1148, the first miracle occurred in relation to the Virgin Mary. While this itself made the town famous, in 1166, things went a step further, when a body that was supposedly that of Saint Zacchaeus was found in a nearby rock. Now, while this was impossible, after all, even biblical records attest that he died in the Holy Land some thousand years before, this didn't stop the entire town from being regarded as a pilgrimage site, and it became part of the famous St. James Way pilgrimage route. 
In any case, whether you're religious or not, I'd say that a visit to this town is certainly worth it. Best of all, given its location just two hours away from Toulouse, it would make the perfect stop on a road trip around central France. Number 9. Frankenmuth Generally speaking, you wouldn't think that a beautiful fairy tale town would be located in the car loving shopping mall filled suburban sprawl that is the Midwestern United States. However, Frankenmuth is a rare, charming town in what was otherwise a relatively bland area. It's located about an hour and a half outside of Detroit. It was founded all the way back in 1845 by conservative Lutheran immigrants from central Germany. Slated to be primarily a religious community, great efforts were undertaken to make sure the town was as German as possible. Measures such as continuing to swear loyalty to Prussia and continuing to speak German were instated by the first colonists, and until the Second World War, German immigrants regularly poured in. It was in the spirit of German patriotism that the town was therefore built to look like something right out of the old country. After all, most of the buildings are inspired by traditional Bavarian architecture, with many dating all the way back to the town's founding. It also has many other factors that help keep that fairy tale German tradition alive. For example, not only do they continue to have German festivals and an annual Oktoberfest celebration, but they're also home to Brona's Christmas Wonderland, which promotes itself as the world's largest Christmas store and sells enormous quantities of Christmas decorations within a store with decidedly Alpine architecture. To this day, the German language is still prevalent here, and the German speakers continue to reside in the town. In addition, the Church of St. Lorenz offers monthly services in the German language, making it a cultural hub in an otherwise relatively Anglophone state. So, if you're looking for a cool place to stop on a road trip through Michigan, Frankenmuth is definitely a fantastic option. Number 8. Chef Schoan while blue may be a beautiful color, it's not every day that an entire town is painted in the stuff. Yet that's exactly what you can witness if you visit Chef Chouan in northern Morocco. Filled with blue-washed buildings and narrow streets, it's a beautiful place to walk through. However, exactly why this place is as blue as it is is up for debate. The most dominant story is that the paint is connected to Jewish beliefs. This is because for Jews, the color blue represents the sky, which in turn reminds people of heaven and God. While the practice likely began in the 15th century, it grew more popular in time, with the last wave of houses being converted from white to blue, probably occurring when the Jews fleeing the Holocaust moved there in the 1930s. However, given the tensions between the Muslims and the Jews, the sizable Muslim population likely didn't copy a Jewish cultural tradition for religious reasons. Therefore, some other theories have been suggested as to why so many of these homes are blue. Some historians believe that it was in an attempt to keep mosquitoes away. You see, while mosquitoes like to live nearby water, they usually don't like to live in it. Therefore, it is possible that the Muslim population noticed that the Jewish areas of the city had less mosquitoes, and so decided to follow suit. Others say that the blue represents the Mediterranean Sea, or the Ras al-Ma waterfall in a symbolic sense, with the hues being painted in thanks to the bodies of water that make life here possible. There are even some who instead insist that there is no deeper meaning, saying that everyone painted their houses blue in order to fit in with the rest of the neighborhood. Yet regardless of the origins, what is clear is that this blue town is awesome. Moving on to number 7, Hobbiton. If you've watched or read The Lord of the Rings, then you're certainly familiar with Hobbiton. Featured in both the Lord of the Rings film trilogy and the Hobbit film trilogy, the town of Hobbiton was home to famous Hobbit adventurers Bilbo and Frodo Baggins. Yet while you might expect it to have been a quick film set that was torn down, you may be surprised to find out that the town of Hobbiton has been maintained as a tourist site even after all the movies were filmed. Located on a family-run farm on the upper area of New Zealand's North Island, it was chosen by movie director Peter Jackson because he believed it to look like, quote, a slice of ancient England. Whether that's true, we'll leave that up to you to decide. However, what's certainly the case is that they made the site look incredible. Home to 37 different hobbit holes and their associated gardens and hedges, a mill, a double arch bridge, and a 26-ton oak tree, Hobbiton truly does look like something out of a fairy tale. To make it look as authentic as possible, Peter Jackson made the wise decision to not use it right away. Rather, he let it stay in place for about a year, allowing weeds to grow in the cracks so that it had a real lived-in feel. The end result was something that very closely matched what's described in the books, and while parts have been torn down and changed since filming, 
village is more or less similar to what was on day one. If you'd like to give the village a visit, you can book a two-hour tour, which includes excursions into some of what are now 44 hobbit holes, and end with the chance to have refreshments at the Shire's Rest Cafe afterwards. However, due to its popularity, I'd suggest booking in advance and being ready to pay at least 55 bucks for the basic experience. Number 6. Krakow when we think of a fairy tale like town, somewhere that's been abandoned is usually not what comes to mind. However, it is fair to say that Krakow is an exception to this rule. It's located in the southern Italian province of Basilicata. Old tombs found in the area suggest that the town was founded all the way back in the 8th century BC. While this was a rather unstable time to live in Italy, the people of Krakow had one thing going for them. Their town was located atop a 400 meter tall cliff. This made it very easy to defend against invaders, and throughout the Middle Ages it continued to grow with the addition of a guard tower and palazzi in the town. In 1561 it reached its peak population of 2,600 people, but from there a slow and steady decline took place. The wars of Italian unification in the mid-1800s and the decision of many townspeople to emigrate to the New World took a number on the town. Yet the final nail in the coffin was caused by human error. That's because poorly installed sewer and water systems began to make the dirt Krakow was built upon extremely damp and unstable. This led to a series of mudslides, and in 1963, things got so bad that the majority of Krakow's residents were forced to move to the nearby town of Krakow Peschera. While this was the end of Krakow being an inhabited city, the resulting ghost town was not left out of the spotlight. Due to its beautiful old buildings and eerie yet compelling vibe, it was chosen as a filming place for the famous films such as The Passion of the Christ and Christ Stopped at Eboli. Outside of the film industry though, the town still does have some sparks of greatness. After all, six times per year, locals return to celebrate religious festivals dedicated to the Virgin Mary. However, if Catholicism isn't your thing, you can also visit the town on a licensed guided tour. However, be prepared to wear a hard hat, as these are necessary in order to protect yourself from falling debris. Number 5. El Bero Bello If you drive just an hour outside the central Italian city of Bari, you'll reach the picturesque town of El Bero Bello. Founded back in the 16th century by sharecropping peasants, they built a peculiar type of housing for themselves called Etruli. In essence, these are homes built directly onto limestone bedrock using a dry stone wall technique. In other words, they don't require any mortar or cement. These bricks then stack up to create a cone-shaped roof that allows rainwater to flow off the sides, while the thickness of the walls and the few windows ensure that the inside is warm in the winter and cool in the summer. The end result is a home that looks like something out of a Dali-esque fairy tale. It's perhaps because of this that they're often referred to by tourists as fairy houses. Of course, this leaves us with one question. Why were these built instead of the more traditional houses that can be found in the nearby area? Well, to answer that question, many point to a tale that dates back to 1654. The story goes that local Count Gian Gerolamo Acquaviva was called to court to explain to the Spanish king why he wasn't paying taxes on all the dwellings on his land. He protested that there were no such dwellings and invited the court to review his properties. Before they could arrive, though, the count destroyed the town and sent the people to live temporarily in the woods until the review was complete. Once the court left satisfied, he permitted his people to return on the condition they created homes that could be easily torn down. It was out of this that Truly may have been born, and can be easily be demolished by removing the center support, and until later in history they were generally only used as temporary shelters rather than permanent homes. Now, whether or not the story is actually true is most certainly up for debate. However, no matter what the origin story, I'd suggest visiting this peasant town turned UNESCO World Heritage Site if you're looking for a truly unique experience. Number 4. Assisi if you want to truly feel like you've been transported back in time, then a trip to the town of Assisi may just be on the books. Located in the central Italian province of Umbria, it's been settled ever since the year 1000 BC. However, what makes it famous is its mixture of both peaceful charm and religious significance. You see, back in 1181, St. Francis was born there and would go on to establish the Franciscan religious order in the town in 1208. St. Clair would follow suit not long after, founded by the Poor Sisters, and ever since, both organizations have done a considerable amount of preaching and charitable work under the guise of the Catholic Church. In the case of St. Francis, though, he was famously reported pacifying a wolf by convincing it not to attack Assisi's townspeople. 
successfully preaching to animals who would come and listen to full sermons and healing those that were sick or injured of their ailments. Meanwhile, St. Clair achieved fame for reportedly fending off imminent attacks on her convent by simply praying to God, feeding 50 sisters of her order with just one loaf of bread through a multiplication miracle, having a vision of mass when she was too sick to go to church, and having an incorruptible body after her death. Now, whether or not these miracles happened is up for debate. However, what is certainly true is that a visit to Assisi is unlike any other. Built on a steep, sloping hill, there is a sense of peace and quiet and serenity that's felt while walking through the medieval village. Beyond the various churches, Assisi is also home to its fair share of sandwich shops, cafes, and bakeries, all of which waft delicious scents into the air. Its location on the top of a hill and the fact that it's an old town surrounded by medieval walls makes it feel isolated from the hustle and bustle of the rest of the world, while the high altitude means that from many points in the town you can look down into the valley below, which is full of forests and fields that are green and teeming with life. It is thanks to all these factors that many people would argue that Assisi is nothing short of magical. Number 3. Gokayama when you think of a fairy tale village, a castle with beautiful medieval style village is probably what comes to mind. However, while it has neither a castle nor medieval architecture, Gokayama gives these places a run for their money. Considered to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it holds this distinction thanks to its trademark Gasosukuri houses. Dating back to the early 1700s, this style of architecture uses some clever design tricks to adapt the environment around it. In essence, these houses have a rectangular base and a pointed roof, with the base and the roof being two very distinct pieces. Now, generally speaking, specialized carpenters will create the base, while the creation of the roof will be a community effort. The roof makes the shape of a near-perfect equilateral triangle, with this being because the 60-degree angle at the top ridge is considered to be very resilient against weight and pressure from wet, heavy snow and strong seasonal winds. In order to create the shape, villagers will use beams from bent trees that grow on the slope of the mountain. This curved wood, which is called chonobari, plays a key role as they help distribute the weight of the roof onto the pillars. In order to hold everything together, the villagers opt to use not a single nail. Instead, they use ropes and vines to keep everything in place, while not actually bolting down any of the corners where the wood meets. While this may sound like a recipe for disaster, this technique allows the wood beams to be far more flexible in the event of wind or snow, allowing them to adjust with the weight rather than just snap when the load becomes heavy. In any case, what's perhaps most incredible about this village is that it very easily could have been wiped out and modernized. That's because during the years of the Meiji Restoration in the mid to late 1800s, Japan's rapid efforts at modernization meant that many older villages were quickly improved upon and rebuilt in order to match modern standards. The problem with this is that it led to the destruction of many historical sites. However, thanks to the village's secluded location on the upper reaches of the Shogawa River, its traditions managed to survive without the outside interference. Number 2. Cinque Terre All right, I'll admit we're cheating a bit with this one. That's because while Cinque Terre is a beautiful area, it consists of not one, but five fairy tale towns that are all absolutely stunning. It's located on the Italian Riviera in the northwest of Italy. Cinque Terre is not as famous as many of the towns on the Amalfi Coast. However, they certainly give Amalfi a run for its money. Translating to the five lands in English, the area is known for its stunning cliffs, natural beauty, delicious food, and of course, its five namesake villages. The first, known as Rio Maggiore, is Cinque Terre's easternmost village. A cascade of colorful buildings siphoned down a steep ravine into a picturesque harbor, making it one of the most scenic of the five. Since it's also the largest, it's also the most popular home base for travelers and great for younger people who are looking for a mix of fun activities and a good nightlife. Best of all, with its botanical garden, medieval castle, and pebbly Fasola beach all being at the taking, it's difficult to get bored while staying here. If you go just a little bit west of Rio Maggiore, you'll reach Manarola. Originally serving as a pirate lookout, it's supposedly the oldest of the five villages and is filled with medieval relics, grape vines, and beautiful fishing harbor, making it the perfect place for everyone from history buffs to those looking to spend a quiet night at a great seafood restaurant. Corniglia is in the middle of the line and is by far the smallest. Sitting atop a 100-meter-high rocky cliff, it's the only town that doesn't have direct sea access, but its great views, good hiking trails, and lack of tourists more than make up for that. The fourth town is known as Vernazza, known for its safe, naturally protected harbor. It's got a series of winding streets, beautifully colored buildings, and most impressive of all, the imposing Doria Castle. The final and westernmost town is the area known as Monterosso. 
Known for being relatively flat and having very wide, sandy beaches, its easy access to the sea makes it the perfect village for families with kids and for those with mobility issues. Now, the cool thing about this coastline is not only that it has five beautiful villages, but it also has some solid transportation. That's because while many opt to take the long hike between the five villages or to drive from town to town, they're also connected by a convenient train line that runs on a very regular basis. However, due to the beauty, Cinque Terre has become very busy, with overpriced hotels, busy trails, and throngs of tourists all being the norm. So while Cinque Terre is still a beautiful place to visit, I'd suggest staying away in the summer months and only visit during the off-season. Number 1. Siena if you're looking to stay in a picturesque medieval town that's also home to tons of activities, great food, and a solid nightlife, you can't do much better than Siena. Originally founded by the Etruscans hundreds of years before the advent of the ancient Romans, it was controlled as a small feudal town until around the year 1115. That's because after the death of the Countess Matilda in that year, her holdings broke apart, and ultimately the Republic of Siena was formed. It remained a republic from the 12th century until the Spanish occupation in 1555, and it was during this time period that the city became a major economic center and one of the main rivals to the even larger town of Florence. While the infamous Medici family controlled much of its economic life after the Spanish occupation, from here on Siena embarked on a period of decline. However, that doesn't mean that Siena isn't an interesting place. Perhaps thanks to this decline, Siena has retained a lot of the old architecture and traditions that made it a vibrant medieval town. Built on a massive hill, the entire city slopes upwards in a series of streets and tall buildings that make it feel as if you're fully immersed in a town that lives hundreds of years in the past. It's also one of the only few cities on the planet surrounded by a fully intact medieval wall, and at its northern end you can walk around a massive fort that was made to defend the city from invaders. Best of all, its location on the Italian region of Toscana means that it has some of the best food and wine that Italy has to offer, with local favorites such as wild boar and truffles being must-tries. It's also worth noting that Siena has a vibrant cultural life. You see, the town is home to a university which is notable for being one of the oldest and the first publicly funded university in Italy. This has given it quite the reputation, and to this day, students from both Italy and abroad continue to study there during both the regular school year and summer months, ensuring that there's fun to be had all year round. Siena is also pretty cool thanks to its semi-annual Palio. Held on both the 2nd of July and 16th of August every single year, the Palio is a horse race where each of Siena's 17 districts will field a horse and jockey. These jockeys will race for fame and bragging rights, and leading up to the big race, each of these districts will hold nighttime parties. Sometimes these will be as simple as a community meal, while at others there will be dance parties with techno music in the streets. It's because of this that if you're looking to visit Siena, I suggest going in the summer months so you can experience all that this fairy tale town has to offer. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members.